Today's gospel directs our hearts and our minds in the first place, of course, to the Lord Jesus. But today we also have special attention given in the readings to the reality of sin, to the reality of sin and to the way in which sin comes about. That is, it is the ordinary operation of Satan, the ancient serpent, as he is called in the exorcism rites, because indeed Satan is the ancient serpent of whom we heard, of which we heard, in this morning's first reading. He's the father of lies. He is the author of all temptations, and he is the only one who claims victory when people sin. Now, one thing that Pope Paul VI said Pope John Paul the Great said, and Pope Benedict has said, is that our times, our generations, have lost the sense of sin, have lost the sense of the intense wickedness of moral evil. As we pray today for those affected, killed, had their lives ruined by the earthquake and the tsunami as we pray for them. And as we see how terrible that physical devastation and all of its outcomes are, the possibility of widespread nuclear sickness, terrible, terrible, terrible natural disaster, terrible, terrible, terrible physical evil. It would be hard to imagine a physical evil worse than what we can see live on television happening to our brothers and sisters in Japan. Only a short drive from the site of one of the Blessed Mother's appearances throughout the world in Akita, Japan, just a short distance from there. Terrible physical evil. One mortal sin is far worse than that. That's the sense of sin that we've lost. I think our tendency would be, well, mortal sin, shrug it off a little bit at least the tendency of some. I'll get to confession. I know people that committed ten mortal sins, so why is one any big deal? One mortal sin far surpasses the natural evil, the physical evil of that earthquake and nuclear fallout. One mortal sin. We're called to think about that today. Because as destructive as that earthquake and nuclear problem are, they do not directly attack the very core of what it means to be a human being. As a matter of fact, physical disasters usually draw out our humanity to a greater fullness in the sense that we become so much more unselfish in reaching out to others. Now, we're not hoping for more natural disasters so that we can be more generous in our outreach. That's not the point. But... 
the devastation of that natural disaster is a far less evil than one mortal sin. That's what it means to have a sense of sin. And that doesn't mean, so I, you know, Father said, now Bishop says that, now I'm even more afraid to go to confession than I was before. That's not the idea. But the idea is, the priest in confession is your helper. He is there in the person of Christ to grant mercy and to help with loving pastoral support. That's why he's there. But the gratitude that you have to God, that your mortal sins can be so easily forgiven, is rendered all the more deep because you know how evil a mortal sin is. Far worse than the physical evil of the natural disaster. Far worse. And so one of the things we should pray for during Lent is a deepened sense of sin. We know that the greatest saints always considered themselves the very worst sinners. A very deep sense of sin is necessary for someone to be a saint, to fulfill the destiny of holiness to which he or she is called. So let us take from today's readings that lesson about the malice of sin, and let's not give in to the temptation with the rest of our country and culture to just shrug it off. To call it simply a private matter that we don't care about if others do it. If others sin, they attack the holiness of the church. Sin is a direct attack on the holiness of the church. So it concerns all of us. And we don't want everybody going to confession to one another, but we do care. We do care about the effect every personal sin has on the body of Christ the church. We don't write that off. And so we don't say people's sins are private because they attack the church. It's not just a private matter. The very dignity of the human person is attacked when he or she sins, and the holiness of the whole church is attacked when any one of us sins. Sin is a very grave evil. Let's pray for that realization today as we begin our Lent. Secondly, we have to talk a little bit about the devil. It's very interesting. When the devil decided to take earthly form, what form did the devil take in the book of Genesis? The serpent. As I said, that's why we call him the ancient serpent. Later on, Jesus Christ chose to take an earthly form by becoming true man. He took on himself a truly human nature. Satan took on the nature of a serpent with a very cunning, clever, tricky, lying intelligence. And that serpent, that ancient serpent, the devil, tricked Adam and Eve into disobedience. That's what St. Paul is talking about in the second reading. Through the disobedience of one, all were lost. Adam and Eve, through their disobedience, all were lost. And note it was disobedience. I talked about that last week. 
Lent has everything to do with the virtue of obedience. Through an act of disobedience, salvation was lost. Because the serpent lied to Adam, even told him, if you eat the fruit of the tree, if you disobey, you will be equal to God. And they bought it, and they did it, and salvation was lost. It's that simple. Has Satan's power grown over time down through history? Look at the gospel. We don't have Satan the serpent tempting Adam and Eve. We have Satan the demon having the nerve to tempt Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth. Just think of the utter gall and pride that Satan acquired down through history that he would try it with Jesus. He thought he was quite something. Because things have gone well for Satan at the surface down through history. To the point where he dared to tempt Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it was the same temptation with which he tempted Adam and Eve. If you disobey, you will be equal to God. And he says to Jesus, I'll make you the Lord of the whole world if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. The only one who is worthy of worship, Jesus Christ, is now being told that he can be the king of the universe if he prostrates himself down on the ground and worships the devil. Again, make yourself equal to God, become the king of the universe. Jesus knew that he was the king of the universe. He knew that Satan could not make him the king of the universe. He knew that that was one big lie. And so he says, be gone. The Lord your God will you worship and him alone shall you adore. Get out of here, he said to Satan. And he meant, get the hell out of here, when he said that to Satan. Get out. I will not be deceived the way Adam and Eve were. And through his obedience, as St. Paul says, through the obedience of that one, everyone was justified. Just as through the disobedience of, of Adam and Eve, everyone lost salvation, through the obedience of Jesus Christ, everyone was saved and justified. The importance of obedience in our relationship with God and the importance of realizing that the ancient serpent always was, is, and always will be a, a, a liar bent on the destruction of humanity. Sin is a very grave evil. The devil wants to do nothing but destroy you and me at our deepest core. He's a very serious adversary, every bit as much the ancient serpent as he ever was. Lent is a time to give Satan a great deal to worry about and to give the angels and saints in heaven a great deal to rejoice about. Let's do it. Praise be Jesus Christ.